Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind the Holyfield Bow Trilogy, possibly the most memorable series of fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. When Mike Tyson was convicted of rape and sent off to prison in early 1992, Evander Holyfield was left to search for other ways of proving that he was, as he said, the real deal. He chose to fight the best young American heavyweight, Olympic silver medalist Riddick Bowe. What followed was the greatest heavyweight trilogy since Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. As heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield prepared to meet Riddick Bowe in 1992, he was regarded as an undersized overachiever. As a light heavyweight in the 1984 Olympics, he suffered a controversial disqualification. As a pro, he won the 190-pound title, which had little public appeal. Though lacking the natural size of a heavyweight, Holyfield set his mind to conquering that division as well. My coach told me at eight years old that I could be the heavyweight champ of the world. I hadn't reached a goal. If I would have just stayed the junior heavyweight champ of the world, been undefeated and retired. He had the skills and smarts, but what made him special was his belief that he could break his opponent's will, no matter his size. I chose to be insecure about what I thought the people would say. I wanted to prove to the guy, you know, you hurt me, I'm gonna hurt you back. Holyfield always talked about how he would box, and then of course he would get hit, and he would start a brawl, and that was his nature. The bigger his opponents, the bigger his will seemed to grow. There was a, a moment in the Holyfield Foreman fight. Another left hook, and a right. When Evander went after George and landed 18, 19 punches in a row, he just wasn't going to take no for an answer. But his inability to KO former champions Foreman and Larry Holmes seemed to confirm the view he was an outstanding fighter, but not the type of dominant heavyweight fans preferred. People thought of him as a blown up light heavyweight, a blown up cruiserweight. There was this thought that he was just holding on to a title that still really belonged to Mike Tyson. Tyson had lost the crown perhaps the biggest upset in boxing history, to 40 to one underdog Buster Douglas in Tokyo. Eight months later, Holyfield won the championship by knocking out Douglas in the third. Still, respect was elusive. And they say, you know, the only reason why you won that because this guy was overweight. And I knocked him out, but people said, well, Tyson hit him harder than that. After a dynamic powerhouse like Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield, wasn't appreciated for the great fighter he was. It was hard for people to accept that someone can be the heavyweight champ of the world and not be as big a puncher as Tyson. Only a fight with Tyson could convince the skeptics, and one was scheduled for November of 1991. However, delays caused first by an injury to Tyson's rib and later by his rape conviction deprived fight fans of the most eagerly anticipated heavyweight fight in years. With Tyson in prison, Holyfield scheduled a giant of a young fighter from Tyson's neighborhood in Brooklyn, the unbeaten Riddick Bowe. There were questions about Bowe's qualifications. The knock on him was that he was lazy. There were rumors all the time. He had to be barred from going to the kitchen during training. It was difficult to get him to get up and do his road work. I was with Riddick when he was an amateur. And uh, we had a lot of fun, but he never showed the drive to be a champion. Louis brought him in as a sparring partner for Tyrell Biggs. Tyrell was beating the living shit out of him every day, primarily because he was just going through the motions. But no one questioned Bo's pure talent for fighting. We knew that he had the size, we knew he had the speed, we knew he had the strength and the talent. What we didn't know was whether if, when the going got tough, whether he was going to be able to step it up. As he showed against trial horses Pierre Coetzer and Bigfoot Martin, Bo was not the usual plotting giant. Taking on Holyfield for the title, however, would require a new level of commitment. He was the guy that I boxed when I was an amateur, he was a professional. But I knew that from his attitude and his makeup, when your father got like you Vander Holyfield, I mean, I'm gonna tell you, Vander comes to get it. So I never underestimated him. You never saw a more focused, more serious Riddick Bow. It was perhaps the best training camp that we've ever had. Bow was ready to fight for the title. 
crowd of 18,000 awaits the fourth title defense for Evander Holyfield, a defense which now becomes the biggest test for respect in his two-year reign as champion. On November 13, 1992, the challenger appeared ready, but few anticipated the ferocious encounter we'd see that night. The question in the air was, how would Bo deal with the kind of pressure and firestorm that Holyfield was capable of bringing to him? And they brawl in the center of the ring. Bo has answered some questions early in this fight. He was showing a real willingness for combat. Holyfield intended to box and flurry with Bo, as he had against Douglas. But that plan was quickly abandoned. He hit me so hard, and but because of pride, I stayed there so long, both my eyes were swollen up so I couldn't see from the outside. So it's just a night of me standing there toe to toe. Fighting at this furious pace, many felt Bo would wilt. Ready Bo used to be my sparring partner. A smart fighter, good hand speed, inside and outside. But he was known for running out of gas. The left and a right by Holyfield and the left. These are solid shots, but the champion does not seem able to hurt Riddick Bowe. Now, why did he run out of gas? Round by round, the excitement was building, but it was the 10th round which took the fight into the stratosphere. Bowe stuns him with an uppercut, and just like that, the champion struggles to stay on his feet. What a hard by Holyfield. He's going to stay on his feet. He's hanging in there. He hit me with an uppercut. Oh, it's just the shot. Oh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I know that I'm hit. Now I go on defense, and he's swinging them for life. Gets away from the right hand, blocks another one. Bo throwing and throwing. Now goes to the body. Holyfield somehow standing up. Riddick laid so much punishment on Evander in the first minute and a half of the round that it was pretty hard to fathom how Evander was standing up. Joe Cortez watching. Champion gets the benefit. It was just a matter of him getting hit one more devastating blow before I would have stopped it. However, Holyfield has been known to get staggered and come back. If you can feel the pain, then you're still in the game. It's when you don't feel the pain, you're out. This damn pit bull from Georgia would not go down. Evander Holyfield's incredible powers of recovery once again on display. And all of a sudden, the storm got quiet. Uh-oh, now. Oh, boy, I'm going to hurt you. All of a sudden, he had Riddick on the run. And for the last 30 seconds of the round, you're wondering how Riddick is going to finish. Look at Holyfield. What a warrior. Reversing the tide of the battle. The champion now has bow wobbling. And he lands a right hand. Everybody in the Thomas and Mack Center are on their feet. A right hand by Holyfield. When the bell rung, I said, man, I just had 10 more seconds. Now, now, in the whole fight, now, that's the only round that I was wishing that it could have been a little bit more time. I said to myself, so this cat here, you all right? I was impressed with him, you know. Pat him on the stomach at the end of the round. I mean, that's a good round, you know. They both survived the storm, but it took more out of Holyfield than Bo. Holyfield was floored in the 11th. Again, Holyfield proved his resilience. The champion entered the 12th, needing a knockout to retain the title. It was not to be. From the back of the arena now, they begin to rise and applaud what has been an extraordinary battle between two men of heart and will and courage and skill. It could have been one of those old fights that went 20, 30 rounds. The bell rang to end the 12th round, and it was like, you know, they were saying, 12 rounds isn't enough. We need to go until somebody can't go anymore. And new heavyweight champion of the world, Riddick. And it was devastating to me. Did he win? Oh, yeah, 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 he, he won. And he won it the right way. He took the fight. Riddick Bowe emphatically answered any doubts about his resolve. His heart 
had always been questioned. And I felt like, God damn it, question this. Look at this man. Look at this athlete. Look at this competitor. And Holyfield's valor showed that a heavyweight champion could be measured by qualities other than power. There is no doubt whatsoever that the 10th round completely won over all the skeptics for Holyfield. Following the loss, Holyfield briefly considered retirement before winning a decision over journeyman Alex Stewart in June of 1993. Bo's life, of course, changed overnight. The heavyweight championship is what you make of it, and Bo's manager, the newcomer Rock Newman, intended to make a lot of it. I remember thinking, Rock Newman has a heavyweight champion. We're going to see some entertaining things. Newman had Bo toss his WBC championship belt into a trash can, scrapping an understanding that he would fight Lennox Lewis. If anyone has criticism of me because I fought, scratched, and clawed for my client's interest, bring that criticism on. To further promote the personable new champion, Newman took Bo on an Ali-like world tour. It expanded Bo's horizons and his waistline. I had a chance to meet the Pope. Um, I was in Somalia, I was in Germany, I was all over the place. By the time you get to traveling all over the world and shaking people's hand and smiling, you don't get a chance to train. Rock Newman is a smart guy who thinks out of the box, and he was going to try to market Bo as a world figure. He outthought himself. To this day, a defiant Newman disagrees. In spite of the fact that many say that the world tour had something to do with his problems, he came back, he went into training, he fought Jesse Ferguson in May. It is a fight that Eddie Futch says that he thought that Bo looked better than he had ever looked, ever. Whether or not the world tour adversely affected Bo, a bigger distraction was a constant battle of the bulge. Bo was not a partier, was not a drinker, smoker, or drugger. What he did is he gorged himself. If there was a piece of cake over there that, it was, that was, you know, telling me to come get it, I went and got it. It was clear when Bo met Holyfield for the rematch that Bo did more eating than training. It's more than just the extra 11 pounds. He looks softer all over, right, George? He is not proud of his body tonight. Holyfield added 12 pounds, but it was all muscle demonstrating that his hunger was only to recapture the title he had lost. With new trainer Emmanuel Stewart, Holyfield agreed to stick to the strategy he abandoned in the first fight. I says, we're gonna beat him with rhythm, speed, techniques, moves that would make Riddick Bowe's larger size become a handicap instead of an advantage. The change worked as Holyfield dictated a more deliberate pace in the early rounds. Holyfield has got the fight in his hand now. He's double jabbing. Everything he does, he, he moves first and then he retreats good afterwards. By adopting a different strategic tack, Evander had thrown Riddick just enough off balance to, to make it a different fight. He was standing out of harm's way. He kind of frustrated me with his movement. Bo throwing one punch at a time. I was counter punching, then I was able to lead. That second fight was, you know, was a masterpiece. A masterpiece that looked like it would go unfinished. And somebody in a parachute has just landed on the edge of the ring, has been pulled away by security guards. The fight has been brought to a halt. There's a massive melee at ringside. I see this guy come crashing into the rope. When it did that, uh, you know, that look on my face and Red Bull, like, turn around and look at him, he was kind of skeptical and look back like I was joking. I thought he'd seen King Kong. Chaos. Surreal. Just bizarre. We were disoriented. No one knew what this meant. And I thought, this has got to be a dream. Maybe I didn't wake up in time. Couldn't be real. The fight stopped. People reaching over and pulling him down and starting to pound him. He got his ass thoroughly smashed. I saw Caesar's Palace security. I saw our security. I saw the fruit of Islam. Everyone converging on this guy. I was thinking, does he have a weapon? Is he carrying a bomb? And people began to scream. And 
some people pull out their guns. I grabbed Mrs. Boy and we hit the floor because we figured they were going to be shooting would be in, in our direction. My first thought was it was an attempt on either Farrakhan or Jesse Jackson's life. Pandemonium broke out. This is a monumental disaster. Right now, police are filing by me at ringside and grabbing this gentleman who has created a monstrosity of an interruption in the bout. With Fan Man finally removed, the question became, what next? I don't know what we would have done if they would have refused to fight anymore. Um, I knew that Bo's wife was taken on a stretcher that night. I have just gotten word that Riddick Bo's wife has just fainted at ringside. Gentlemen, she's in the early stages of her fourth pregnancy. She's fainted with excitement and maybe even fear. We had to take her out. I thought about it for a long time, standing there, if I should go with her, if I should stay here. To the extent that we could have some coherent discussion, it really focused on him feeling a need to get out of the ring and go be with his pregnant wife versus whether or not he should stay there and fight and try to defend his title. I never wanted people to say that Riddick Bo was a quitter. He could have continued to fight but he got out the ring or whatever the case may be, so I didn't want to open that door. After a 21-minute delay, the fight resumed in round seven, already in progress. One minute, 50 seconds remain in the round. Well, I suppose that if a wasp came into Picasso's studio and stung him on the nose, he'd go and get some ice and go right back to his easel, and that's what the fighters did. Who had benefited from the delay? Bo saw his wife in distress. Holyfield saw a weary opponent get a rest. If it wasn't been for that man that flew in, you know, <laughs> for the short night. When the fight resumes, he come out there, he start throwing punches. I was overwhelmed. It takes me damn it, to end the fight to get warmed back up, and by this time, I'm behind on points. I realized that what I have won is sixth round, but you know what? The fight is over at the 12. Left-right combination. Bo misses with the uppercut. Should've used my jab because he couldn't get away from the jab and he couldn't get around it. But if I'd used my jab, it would be better. Yeah, I don't want to fight hands down. Riddick still had his moments. Holyfield staying in, becoming a target. Bo starting to heat up. It was a really close fight. It was doggone near impossible to separate them and try to figure out who had actually won the fight. So close, in fact that the scoring of the disrupted seventh round played a major role in Holyfield regaining the title. The three judges, one scored it for Bo, one scored it even, one scored it for Holyfield. If the judge who scored it for Holyfield would have scored that round for Bo, then Bo would have kept his title, would have turned out to be a draw. And so this fan man may have caused a change in boxing history. Holyfield had recaptured the title, but subsequently lost it to Michael Moore. During the course of that bout, some, major health concerns water. arose. A vandal complained of pain in his shoulder. He developed some shortness of breath, and there appeared to be a, an obvious problem with his heart. I'll read it. He was transferred back to Emory, and they concurred. They showed a model of his heart and talked about the problems. What we see with his heart, though, is the elasticity is not quite normal, that it, it doesn't expand as easily as we would expect a heart to do. Not satisfied with these conclusions, Holyfield visited a faith healer and pronounced himself fit to fight. The Nevada State Athletic Commission, however, needed medical evidence. I'm a medical guy. I can only look at, at black and white and a database. So we sent Evander to the Mayo Clinic for the most intensive medical evaluation any athlete in history has been through. The doctor there was able to let me know that, you know, you weren't born with a heart condition. And what has happened is that they overhydrated you and they gave you too much morphine, which caused my heart to blow up. So in time, that the heart is, it went back down and it's all right. He said, you are right to fight. Satisfied with the results of the Mayo Clinic evaluation, the Nevada State Athletic Commission granted Holyfield a license which meant a rubber match with Bo. No title would be at stake, but it was still the biggest heavyweight fight that could be made. It was perhaps the most brutal 
of the three fights. Hard right hand by Bo. Holyfield comes back with a left. They both absorbed a tremendous amount of punishment. A persistent theme in the trilogy, hunting after the bell. Holyfield was quickly exhausted, raising concerns that his heart was in distress again. This is a very dangerous fight, as far as I'm concerned, for Evander Holyfield. This man is, can, is not able to catch a second win. This man is going to end up in a pine box. I understand the frustration and the concern of George Foreman. So, you know, this guy's going to die, but it, it wasn't my heart. But what it was, was something that could have endangered his life by weakening him in the ring. Recent revelations explain Holyfield's fatigue. I wrapped his hands every morning. He was sitting there and his eyes was yellow as I don't know what. I said, man, what's, what's wrong with you? I didn't know it until after the fight, but Evander had, had contracted hepatitis. I ate some seafood and got hepatitis A, and my doctor told me, you should fight. Your energy level gonna go up and down, up and down. Despite being diagnosed with hepatitis A, Holyfield chose to fight. By round five, he appeared to be finished. Holyfield taking a couple stop, of heavy shots. Stop. Holyfield is really hurting. He just became 33 going on 53. It looked like he was all through as a fighter, like he had spent so much to prove what he had proven. I recall thinking the end is near for Holyfield. And then early on the sixth round, I ran through left hook to the body, through left hook to my shoulder. Ain't no big deal. Boom! <laughs> Everything went blank. As promised by his doctor, though, Holyfield's energy surge wouldn't last. And now Holyfield seems to have run out of gas. He was hurt, and, and I didn't do nothing because I didn't have the energy to finish. He let a bow off the hook. I had Holyfield been able to hurt Bo a little bit more in that round, I would have had no choice but to stop the contest. I was disappointed in myself. I had the courage to get in that ring that way. But when it came to the final test, to just throw in a few punches and not worry about how I felt, I didn't do it. Holyfield had one more energy surge in the eighth round. He was capable of those 20 seconds of throwback to what you had seen before. Hard right hand inside by Holyfield, and now down goes Evander. And then just as suddenly, gone again. Third knockdown this of is Holyfield's it. career. This is the, end. the fourth, and that's it. That's it, that's it. That's there was this shell of Holyfield there in the ring where Evander's flaming spirit had once been. With that, the trilogy came to a close with Bo having won two of the three bouts. The boxing world was witnessing the beginning of an end, a surprise end. I always figured Holyfield would be the guy who'd come out for the worse. Turns out <laughs> that the guy who was really hurt in this trilogy was Bo, physically and psychologically. Indeed, Bo's career had peaked against Evander Holyfield. He fought just twice more, taking bad beatings in disqualification wins against Andrew Galata. Riddick Bowe allowed his worst instincts to take over, and his worst instincts were laziness, gluttony. If he was driven by anything, he was driven by hunger to eat, but certainly not by hunger to be great. By contrast, Holyfield's legend kept rolling along. We thought after the third fight that this would be the end of Holyfield's run as a great fighter. But of course, it worked the other way. Holyfield regrouped to have more great fights as he did most famously against Mike Tyson. While the Tyson fights helped define Holyfield's high standing in history, the epic bow fights defined him in victory and defeat as the noblest of warriors. You saw the best of Evander Holyfield and you saw the best of Riddick Bow. These two guys were made for each other. It would have been impossible for anyone to foresee that the seemingly spent shell of Holyfield we saw in that third fight against Bo would knock out Mike Tyson just 12 months later. It might have been equally difficult to envision the demise of Bo, whose two ensuing fights with Andrew Galata were as bizarre in their way as Fan Man's flight. 
As for the man on the power glider, James Miller was found dead on a trail in Alaska at age 39 in March 2003. Thanks for watching The Tale of Holyfield Bow.